Streaming live from the Paul and Catherine Ranke Memorial Studio, this is TV Free Baltimore. Support for TV Free Baltimore comes from viewers like you. Become a TV Free Baltimore member by visiting patreon.com slash TV Free Baltimore. Hello and welcome to Maryland Politics. I'm your host, Beth Lawson. In studio this evening, we have Richard Addis, who is running for Worcester County Commissioner, District 6, as a constitutional conservative and a citizen leader, not a politician. Richard, welcome to our show. Can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and what prompted you to run? Well, thank you for having me, Beth. And again, my name is Richard Addis and I am running for Worcester County Commissioner District 6. And I'm going to be a citizen leader, not a politician. And I get asked all the time, what's going to, what's the difference between the two? A politician is working for the next election. As a citizen leader, I plan on working for the next generation. Uh, I have a basis in the Constitution. I've taken courses at the Institute on the Constitution for both our federal and our state constitution because nobody should be in a position of governance without understanding what governs them. And that is the Constitution. The Constitution was written as restrictions on the government, not restrictions on the people. So I feel I'm uniquely qualified to be county commissioner because of my background. I served six and a half years in the United States Air Force in electronic warfare, the advanced programs division. I served two years in the Air National Guard as a civil engineer. And when I got out of the Air Force and out of the armed services, I moved back to my hometown here in Bishopville, Maryland, where my wife and I began farming. We are first generation farmers, and we now have about 150 acres of corn, soybeans, and winter wheat. In addition to being a farmer, a first generation farmer, I, through the, the years that I've been home, I've worked as a radio technician for a, a municipality. I've worked at NASA Wallops Island, building the payload assemblies for NASA's rock, uh, sounding rocket program, where we built the telemetry systems and payloads. And I currently work as a technician through a company for Motorola radio systems, doing IT backbone infrastructure, as well as radio systems technology. So I have a, a broad depth of knowledge that I feel is going to be crucial to helping this county move forward and get past the, the hurdles that it's seen in the last few years. Anybody, any farmer that is successful will tell you that the most important tool they have is not the plow or the planter or the tractor. It is a sharp pencil. It's knowing how to look into the future and budget into the future to stay for the hard times and prepare for the hard times. I plan on bringing all these experiences to the public office. Obviously, you mentioned earlier a plethora of issues that you're seeing with your current county commissioners. Why do you feel they need to be reminded of your constitutional rights? For instance, the First Amendment. A couple examples. Uh, one is during the commissioner meetings, it's not typical that the citizens are able to speak to the commissioners or when the commissioners are debating something in open session that the citizens can raise their hand, ask questions and address the commissioners. Uh, they typically reserve that for specific meetings on specific days. I feel that's a violation of the First Amendment. The First Amendment guarantees us the right to address our government of grievances. There is no timeline in that. There is no specification of when you can do it. It says that you have the right to do it. And to me, I read that as you have the right to do that at any time. So I, if I can get on the board or on the, you know, on the commission, I believe that any citizen at any time should be able to raise their hand and interface with the commissioners on whatever it is the commissioners are debating or talking about. Because the whole idea of being a citizen leader is to garner the information from the citizen and make an informed decision because those seven commissioners do not know everything there is to know. A citizen could bring new information and completely change the dynamic of what they're talking about. So I think it's important that those citizens have the right to voice their concern about anything that the commissioners are talking about. Uh, going further, um, our county commissioners support a 
conservation uh, program in the county that let's say if a farmer has 100 acres and they fall on hard times and they want to sell an acre to make ends meet, the conservation program says that that farmer can do that, but they have to give up a portion of their land, and I believe it's 7% the first time, and if you subdivide it up to five times, it could be 25% of their land. So 25 acres of that farmer's 100-acre farm is going to be forced into conservation, and it put, they put trees on it. So that farmer is now losing that 25 acres of productive farmland just because they fell on hard times. And it flies in the face of our Fifth Amendment, which guarantees just compensation if government has to take somebody's land under the due process of eminent domain. That is not being done. There's no compensation being given to the farmers or to the landowners when this takes place. And I, it's, it's blatantly unconstitutional and it needs to end. I understand. Do you think that there is any possible valid reason these current commissioners have for not allowing citizens' voices to be heard? The only reason I can come up with is that the meetings would go longer. Um, typically the commissioner meetings start in the morning and they run into the early afternoon, 12, 1, maybe 2 o'clock. If, if that has to run until midnight, that is our job. Our job is to listen to the citizens. And nowhere in the First Amendment does it say the citizen has the right to talk, but only if the meeting is, is kept short. It, it's at any time that the citizens should have the right to interface with their government. Richard, you mentioned your county violating the Fifth Amendment and seizing private property. Why are they possibly doing this? And what, it, as a commissioner, can you do to stop it? Well, this is where the issue gets real interesting because they are not technically seizing the property like you would in a typical eminent domain situation. What they are doing is they are forcing the landowner to put this land in conservation. However, the county does not take ownership of it. The deed stays with the landowner. The landowner still has to pay taxes on that land even though they've lost the right to use it. So did they seize it? No. The landowner still possesses the land. They still have to pay taxes on it. But the government restricted the use of the land to the landowner. And that is where you get into an issue of, is it really eminent domain or not? I feel that any time that they are, they are taking away the power of the, the private property from the citizen, that that is technically an eminent domain issue and that they should receive just compensation if they want to continue doing this program. I can tell you that if I become commissioner, I will push to end this program because it is detrimental to our farmers, our landowners, and they don't have to be big landowners. This could be somebody that just happens to have a small farm at five acres somewhere out in, in the middle of nowhere, who again, like a farmer, would fall on hard time and need to sell a little piece of the land to make ends meet. The same would apply to them, the same acreage percentage of acreage would be taken from them. So I would like to see this program revamped, made voluntary, and done away with. I find what you're saying is extremely concerning about property being seized but not seized. Do you know which branch of the government is actually doing that to these farmers and landowners and who we need to go after? So here in the county, um, it, that program falls mostly under environment, environmental programs, but it also has something to do with our zoning and planning because they're the ones that have to set aside, they specify how many acres and so forth are being uh, taken in the name of conservation. So it's these two uh, agencies within the county government that are running this program. Now there are state and federal programs that mimic this, but we don't have to adopt them and it don't have to be done. So that problem and issue needs to be addressed with environmental programs and the zoning uh, board here in our county. So is that something you as the county commissioner could address and resolve for citizens? I plan, I plan on having meetings with those departments on day one, once I take office, to find out what we can do to make these regulations disappear and put us back on a constitutional plane with respect to land rights. What is your plan 
to bring internet access to the rural areas of your county? And what experience do you have to enact the plan? So this is actually my primary focus and career is in IT technology and systems technology for radio systems. Uh, I work through a company for Motorola and service two-way trunked radio systems, but I have a discipline in IT backbone and, and electronic systems. So my specialty, and I have certifications from Motorola, the Department of Defense, NASA, Corning Fiber, all of which are geared towards IT through multiple disciplines, fiber optic cable, microwave backhaul, um, radio repeaters, as well as 5G and 4G technology through BDA systems. I am the only candidate running in Worcester County and I would be the only commissioner in Worcester County that has this experience. So our issue here in the county is there's many folks that still do not have internet broadband. The internet service providers simply do not provide them the opportunity to get internet. And right now our county seems to be laser focused on fiber optic only, which I feel is doing our county a disservice because they have really put all their eggs in one basket with a single internet service provider. Well, with any business, it's better for the consumer when you have competition. Through multiple, uh, through multiple disciplines, whether it's competition of technology or internet service providers, you get a better product and you get a better price for your consumer. So I think they need to explore all options, whether it's running coaxial cable, fiber optic cable, possibly doing a 5G or 4G mesh topology and providing the people Wi-Fi in the rural areas from multiple repeaters along the way versus running a fiber optic cable. The other issue is they seem to believe that just because the fiber optic cable is above ground that it's a, going to be a detriment and that it needs to be below ground. However, my experience has shown me that most of the time when I go to an issue that has to deal with a fiber break, it's usually fiber that's underground that somebody dug up. Their calls for concern right now is that, oh, well, if we have fiber optic cable running on utility poles in the county and somebody has an accident and runs into the utility pole, that's going to take down the entire fiber. Yes, it will interrupt service of that fiber momentarily, but most of the time there's service loops on the utility poles that can be pulled further down the line and they can fusion splice the fiber back together in a matter of hours and get the service back up and running. The problem with an underground splice is when somebody digs it up underground, now you have to bring in excavation crews put in a manhole, put in service loops, and fusion splice underground, which takes, on average, twice as long to do. So they're, they're really misguided in what they're trying to do in this county. And I've, I've wrote to them or spoke to them multiple times about using multiple technologies. And they, again, seem to be discounting what they're hearing from the citizenry and think that they have all the answers. And that is, Again, an issue that I see with the First Amendment, not listening to the citizens. It sure sounds like you have this very well thought out and a plan in place so that you can start implementing it on day one to help your county. Can you please tell our voters one last time why they should vote for you and how they can get in contact with you? Yes, ma'am. So... I am the only candidate running on a Constitution first platform. Having taken courses at the Institute on the Constitution for both our federal and state constitution, I plan on following that Constitution to the T. The power resides with the people. The people get their power from God. The government gets its power from the people. And it's time that the citizens are reminded of that and it's time that government is reminded of that. And this trickles down into simple issues like property rights. I want people to have the property rights that they should have and what our founders envisioned for the people. I want our schools to get back on track, get back to classical education where they're teaching, reading, writing, math, arithmetic, uh, science. I want them to spe specifically cater to those subjects and stop all of this indoctrination and health mandate that they're the health mandate uh, things that they're putting in the kids' heads and thinking that wearing a mask all the time is normal. It's not normal. It's not normal for for a, a little girl to be told, well, it's okay if you want to be a boy. 
it's not normal for these kids to be indoctrinated on any of these sexual ideologies that they are pushing in our public schools. It has no place there. These kinds of things, if they are issues, need to be at home in the family unit, not at public schools and taught by teachers. So I would like to see all of that gone out of our schools. Thank you so much. But will you please remind us of your contact information, how we can get in touch with you, the voters? Yes, ma'am. I can be reached at my website, thepeopleforrichardaddis.com, or I can be reached on Facebook at Richard Addis for Worcester County Commissioner District 6. Richard, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Well, Beth, thank you for having me. Thank you to TV Free Baltimore for, for hosting this, and thank you for doing what you're doing for conservatism across the state of Maryland. We really appreciate it, and getting these voices out is, is going to be crucial to getting our uh, state back on track. Thank you for watching Maryland Politics. Please like and subscribe our, to our YouTube channel, TV Free Baltimore. I'm your host, Beth Lawson. Stay well and tune in for our next show.